Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for your love and your grace and your mercy. Thank you for each life that's here tonight and the families that are represented. And Lord, you know the hurts and the different things on the plates of the ladies here. You know the hurts. You know the questions that they might have in their heart right now. Father, I pray that you just use what's been prepared to reach a part of their heart. And Lord, that we would all desire to know you more and to be a work in progress, becoming more and more like you. Father, I pray that if there's something in my notes that should not be said or something that should be said, that I would just trust your leading and your prompting. May you be glorified tonight and may we be changed. We love you, Jesus. Amen. At the last time that we met, we talked about, Kelsey and I, my daughter, talked about suffering. How many of you were present at that? So, wow, I guess about half of you. So to summarize that, for those of you that weren't there, Kelsey is my 18-year-old daughter, and she and I shared at the last time about um, an injury that she had, a concussion four years ago when she was 14, and it was a journey through darkness. It was the hardest thing that our family had ever been through because of the concussion for her presented uh, physical, cognitive, mental changes, and we didn't know what to expect. The doctors just told us, you know, her memory would be back to normal in about six months, but it was a journey that was full of unknown and we walked around on eggshells. It was very, very challenging. But she, she shared last time about things that she learned from it, and she's healed now. We're very grateful, of course, for that. And then I also shared of some things that I learned through it. And so tonight, and you can also watch that video. It's on cultivatingahome.com. The video is there. I'd like to thank Grant for videotaping and putting that online for us. So that would be a great resource for you or for anyone you know that is going through a rough time. But tonight I wanted to continue on this to share more with you about how to lead your family, how to guide your family through dark times. And I guess one of the reasons I wanted to share this is so many women have shared with me and plus I've witnessed different ways that we handle this from not talking about it is very common. And maybe some of you grew up in a home where you didn't talk about anything that was challenging and difficult. And so you may have stuffed it all in. And later in life that created maybe lots of pain, emotional difficulties, um, just a lot of hurt. And then maybe the way some react is in anger and outbursts. And that also is damaging. And so I feel like we have something to offer to say how we did go through it. There are things that we did right and there are things we could have done better. But overall, the outcome of knowing Christ more and longing for him to meet every need is what we did. And she wasn't in her right mind. A lot of times she was irrational. And at those times, this wouldn't apply to her because she wouldn't even receive any information and didn't even know. She didn't know how she was behaving. But for me, the caregiver, and for my husband, this is the approach that we took, and I want to share that with you. <coughs> and then also want to point out that each child, each family member that's involved um, in your, or maybe extended family, but those that are in your circle are all affected when you go through suffering. And my belief overall is God is allowing things to happen in our lives. And if you're a mom, then whatever it is can be used. Thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> but whatever it is that God allowed, he's sovereign. So he wants to change us but he also wants to be, to be, he wants that situation to be used for every family member because they're a part of 
the difficulty and the suffering that's taking place. I want you to maybe see things in a different light tonight that not to prevent your children from knowing there's hard times, but to teach them the right framework to have so they see God in it. And so that you're shaping the way that they handle problems in life. They're going to have them. So we do a disservice to our children to act like the Christian walk means there are no problems. Because then when they have them, they could doubt God. Instead, they could, if you have taught them to involve them in trusting God's promises, for example, then when they have it, they've learned by your, your example and by the word of God how to handle these things so they're not surprised and they know how to handle them. And they know that the track record is God's faithfulness and God, his promises are true. And they've watched how you've handled it, not that you never had any problems. Do you ladies feel like maybe you have <clears throat> women on a pedestal, maybe somebody at your church or in a homeschool group that you might be in or, you know, a grandparent or a parent, maybe you have them on a pedestal and it's because they seem perfect. Wouldn't you just like to know of something challenging that they've gone through and how they've clung to the Lord? It does not do us any good for somebody to appear like they have it all together. So that should not be our goal as moms. What good is that to, to try to have an image but what we want to teach our children is how to follow Christ through all things. And the image, we shouldn't even be concerned with that. We, we want to be concerned about the heart and training the heart. And so not just in our families, but ladies, in church, in life, we need to be more real with each other. And I'm not talking about sharing things that hurt each other, you know, like sharing something you don't care for about your husband or, you know, gossiping. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about giving God the glory for bringing you through challenges. And to me, those are the people I really respect, like Lisa Apollo, who lost her husband. In fact, today is the third anniversary of that. I admire her not because she has her act together, although I really think she does, but because I watched her cry out to the Lord and desire wholeheartedly to know him better and to raise her children to be open in the family, to be conscious of the different personalities and the heart of each of them and ask the Lord for guidance on, okay, Lord, what does that child need? Right now he's hurting but how she has gone through hard times, not that she doesn't have them. So I am just putting that out there that that really should be what we're about as Christian women is coming alongside of each other, sharing each other's burdens and being real with each other. Now I'm going to put my laptop aside. I should have done the font size of 30. <laughs> Okay, how our family handled it. In Philippians 2, 16 through 18, oh, I'm sorry, backing it up. I told you that was one of the points, is how we handled it. And the second thing I would like to share with you is help, I'm exhausted. And if, um, I think that we've all been there, or if you haven't, there will be a time when you are there. So starting off with how our family handled it, Philippians 2, 16 through 18 says, Paul says, uh, your grumbling and questioning would be a sign that my investment is in vain. When you're complaining or grumbling, you are not trusting. The right perspective is not complaining and to think, and instead is to think about how we can grow in this situation and how we can grow the body of Christ and advance the gospel. So right there is a framework when you hit difficult times, it's not how I get out of this as soon as I can, although we all do want that. But Lord, you've allowed this. You are going to grow me through it. 
and I will use the good that you've done in my heart, the transformations that have taken place, I'll use that to proclaim of your goodness to other people. I will use it to advance your cause. That should be our stance with our family when we go through difficult times, not freak out. We, we shouldn't ever do that. So if that tends to be what you do, make a note of that, that your reaction is based on fear and self and wanting to control the situation as we all do. But that should be your stance right there is knowing that the situation is gonna grow us. So as a leader in your home, and many of you are blessed to have a husband that is a spiritual leader in your home, and that's a, very much a blessing. But I also realize many of you don't have that. Maybe you're a single mom, and there's, even, there's many of you in here that aren't married and don't have children yet, and this also applies to you, uh, but you are not accountable to another person, namely a spouse. Uh, but if you are married and have a, a husband that might not be taking that role as the spiritual leader, God is working in you with that particular scenario as well. He's working on you still leading the family in the ways of the Lord without disrespecting your husband, without complaining and saying, I wish your dad would do this or in that, but you are showing respect to him on one hand. And on the other hand, you're doing, you are leading your family the way that is the best through a difficult situation. So when I say as a leader, I might be talking to some of the ladies in here. I might be talking to you as a husband and wife because you're a good pair where you talk about things. But no matter what, there is any mom in here, you're a leader. Would you agree with that? You are leading. You are leading. Just this is the way it is. So as a leader, we must have everyone understand this foundation that God is not surprised. He's our rock. He will, we are going to learn through this and he is at work. He's working for our good and for his glory to expect there to be changes and to look forward to the refining he does. There's one point of how we should lead our family. We shouldn't go, oh no, daddy lost his child. I don't know what I'm gonna do. No, immediately we should say, wow, dad, we, wow, well, maybe not use wow, but you can say, well, when my husband lost his job, we gathered everyone together and they were very little. This was 10 years ago. So they were, you know, 13 and under. And we just gathered them together. And I'm sure my husband was probably panicking being the breadwinner of the family. But I stood in the gap. I'm sure I was feeling that as well, but I said, I hugged him and I said, it is going to be okay. And we gathered everybody together at the table and shared with them what happened, but not from the, I don't know what we're going to do, we have to cut expenses everywhere. And, or, but because God is sovereign, we can come to them and explain the situation and say, God's going to meet every need that we have. And we're going to start a journal and we're going to record his faithfulness. Do you see how you've already taught your children right there how to handle a difficult situation calmly? God's in control. We will trust. He will do miracles. So you need to have a journal to record his faithfulness because he promises it to those who love him. Also, we want everyone to talk openly. We want to, moms oftentimes, most of the time, are the ones creating the tone in the home. Would you agree with that? And so just think about it right now. What kind of tone do you usually have? Everybody has a tone and maybe you have several. <laughs> I know I can go here or there, but our tone needs to be fixed on Christ, which is calm and peaceful. And we want everyone to talk openly about this. Again, I'm not saying every single situation should be shared openly. Some things are very private matters, but I think we need to, most of us need to think beyond that and there's a lot more situations we can share with our kids about to produce maturity in them and have them on board with what's going on. Um, being real, tears are fine. Tears with that show distrust 
are not what you want to role model. And if you've done that before, which we all have, then just go back before them and say, you saw me in my fear. And that will be a battle for me. But I do know God's promises are true. And so when I fear kids, just hug me and remind me of God's promises. Remind me that we can trust in God. Or if it's a child that's fearful, you do that with them. I understand about the fear, but I'm going to help hold you on accountable to staying on course with the perspective God wants us to have. You understand? So real emotions are good, but always end it with, we will trust. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Another thing you want to keep in mind as a leader is that their hearts should be safe in your home. And they should be safe with you. And be mindful of each individual person involved and how our actions affect them. If you have children, we've got children of different ages represented here, but if you have older children who already see patterns of exactly how they handle something that was difficult or disappointing to them, there you go. You know what it is. And that would be the beginning point of having a conversation with them and saying, we're going to do things differently because I actually didn't notice that before I allowed you to freak out or I allowed you to become self-centered or I allowed you to became, become anxious because I wasn't aware of it. And I want us to turn situations into the opposite where you are trusting God and turning, taking that anxiety and turning it over to trust or taking the fear and turning it over to trust. Okay, so you have those kind of conversations with them, but within your home, be real with them about how you've done it, how you've handled the unexpected wrong or the challenging wrong. And you're beginning to create that culture within your home to talk openly where your children will share burdens with you with the expectation of praying together, letting the, you know their hearts safe, and keeping each other on track to focus on God's promises. Continuously be in prayer, asking God to give you supernatural insight into the hearts and minds of your children. I've mentioned this several times because I really believe as Christians, we do not tap into this resource that God has given us to pray to the Holy Spirit, and he will give us insight into the hearts of each of our children. And I know right here in this room, it just has to be because of the numbers here that there are Women whose teenagers or children of different ages are distant from them, and it breaks your heart. And you're worried, you're concerned about them. But God is faithful, and he will give you insight. If you ask him, say, Lord, I long to have the heart of my child. Would you show me their hurts? Would you... Give me the plan of attack, not really attack, but would you give me the plan of them beginning to open up their heart? Lord, show me what I've done that has pushed them away. Show me how I've created rebellion or how I've created a distance or a hurt heart. Reveal that to me. And then when he does, begin to change. Don't say, I'm sure that was, no, that wasn't me. It was really his fault. And be defensive. When we're defensive, we're not, we're not, um, humble and we're not willing to grow. We're not teachable. And I'm just going to throw this out there. Have any of you ever had somebody who perhaps has a temperament that is abrasive? We've all experienced that where somebody says something direct to us and it hurts. Am I the only one? Okay. Please understand this. That is tremendous insight. Learn to value, even when somebody says something in an unkind manner to you, first of all, run it through the filter of, is there, is there any truth to that? Sometimes there's not. Sometimes somebody is saying something because they're being ugly and they're hurt. And so there's not. But oftentimes there's truth to it. They just have the temperament that they exposed it where other people are all thinking it. Do you understand? So I think it's good for us to learn, even from the person whose delivery was in an unkind manner, and ask the Lord, is there any truth to that? And then begin to change, and that builds bridges 
and connects hearts with each other. And each child is different. And when you go through a hard time, you're going to have children react differently. And it's up to us and with the help of the Holy Spirit to be on top of that, asking him to show you the one that's introverted or the one that's holding it in or the one that's lashing out or the one that's doing this or that. And he will guide us. And we just need to ask him and wait patiently on that. So I did mention also, ask the Lord to reveal our blind spots. And memorizing scripture is very important. We memorized Psalms 91. I mentioned that last time, and it was just a huge chapter that was very comforting to us during that time. But we've, we try to memorize on an ongoing basis uh, different passages. Another thing as a leader is you want to fight the urge to be self-centered. Now, don't we all do that when somebody's offended us? We go, we ponder on it and we're consumed with it. Has that ever happened to y'all? Again, that's just me. And when you find yourself saying, I, I think about this all day long, we'll catch yourself saying that because that means I'm thinking about myself all day long. I need to think about others. Same thing if your child is is you're having a difficult time in your family. And if your child is consumed with, well, I don't know if we have enough money, we're going to make it. Away. You need to recognize that and retrain that thinking, reprogram it because they're being consumed with how they're going to survive or how they're going to this or that. And you can reassure them, you know, first of all, let them know what they're doing. You know, you might not realize this, but your thoughts are all about you. God says we can trust him. So let go of that. And talk to them in a kind way about it, but you're reprogramming them. So that's all self-centeredness, and we all get that way. Another thing, as a leader, you want to teach and demonstrate and talk about loving the unlovable person. In our family, in our case, specific situation, it was she was very unlovable at the time. And so I could have told all the kids, I know it. She's terrible. <laughs> and I felt like that sometimes. But... I knew God chose, he, he allowed this particular situation. He could have allowed any catastrophe, but this is the one he allowed for our good. And that meant every family member was involved in this. And so as a mom, I wanted to be aware of every family member and what God might be doing to shape the heart of that child, whether it, been, whether it would be a judgmental spirit or a lack of compassion or self-centeredness, and the list goes on and on. But each child has a bend, and this is a great opportunity to see the ugliness that is brought forth and to teach them to have compassion for the other person. I knew in my mind that when this was all over, success one thing of success, so this isn't scriptural, what I'm telling you, this is my words, but in my heart, I really felt like success would be when everybody, when there was a time when everybody was able to talk about it. And I kept that in my mind all the time, throughout the whole time. I was wanting Laura to talk about it. I wanted Heather to talk with me about it. Sometimes we talk about it together when Kelsey wasn't present. But I knew when Kelsey came to the point that she was ready to talk about it, where she wasn't thinking we were mad at her or embarrassed by it, but she knew God allowed it and she needed to use that to proclaim what he did in her heart and in our lives and in our relationships with each other. So we kept that as a foundation throughout the whole time. So whatever situation you have on your plate right now, or maybe it will come up or it might be from the past, God wants to use that. Let him chisel away at those weaknesses in you and in your children to refine you and to refine your family. <clears throat> and actually, there did come a place, a time when Kelsey came up to me and she said, Mom, I'm ready to talk about it. And I was like, what? Mm -hmm. And she said, I'd like to talk about everything that's happened. And I just hugged her and cried because that was a goal. I didn't want children hiding from it, it being secretive. Now, there was, it was very, a very quiet situation when we traveled through it for her protection. But God allowed that. And look, he even let her speak at the last LNO. And then she was asked to speak at our church for a cap and gown 
Sunday, that was the Lord that gave her those opportunities to do that. And I believe he honored that desire of my heart that we would have a family that was able to share openly. Why? Because God worked and we wanted other people to know about it. We wanted to proclaim how good he was through difficulty. Now, did we always feel like that? That it was easy or good? No, we didn't, but we did always have that compass in mind that we knew he was at work. So each family member was indeed affected by this, and each one felt different things and handled things differently, and I asked each to give a quick summary. So my husband, he said he was nervous for her well-being. He was concerned for her safety and injuring herself. He would sing and read to her when she went to bed, not let her go to sleep alone because of fear of the suicide thoughts that she had had. He would call her often to check on her, and he became closer to her. But he knew God was at work changing him, not necessarily trying to change the situation, although we did desperately want that situation to change. He said we were walking around on eggshells and extra aware of her need for rest and need to monitor her decisions. And he recalls her screaming, get out of here as he sat silently and lovingly waiting for her to fall asleep. Our son, John, was 20 at the time. He was away at college, and he would talk on the phone with her, so even though he wasn't under our roof. We wanted each of the children to know why, because we wanted them to be a family. We wanted them to pray, to be concerned. And each family, if if God's allowing this to happen, every family member is affected. So I want to make sure I was allowing God to do his work with John. And he researched things for us. You know, they all react differently. And they all act react based on their personality and their their strengths, their temperament, their their bends. So he researched about it, but he was a faithful prayer warrior. And he recalls coming home many times and praying over her bed at night for her. Is that precious? That couldn't happen had we not involved him in it. And had I not been real and cried and said, "My, I'm concerned, I'm scared. And so he said he remembered when she came back from Argentina and thought it was demonic. It was spiritual warfare is what he thought. I remember we thought that as well for six months until we realized it was a concussion and it was true hallucinations and things like that that are documented. And he remembers, again, praying outside of her room and over her. And he he remembered, too, the same kind of, like, verbal attacks. Like, I wish you weren't, I wish you weren't my mom. He'd hear her say that and lash out to me. And he just remembers her being mean. I don't know if you saw the blog post that I put on the website that was about the load-bearing column. Did any of you read that? It was one of the earlier ones back in the very beginning you know, like 15 posts ago. (laughs) But that particular one was like this long. And then my sweet friend said, "Uh, they need to be way shorter. (laughs) But that one was on the load-bearing column. And that was written because of John. He and I were visiting a church and we were sitting like five or so people down from each other. The different kids were sitting between us. And the pastor shared that example of the load-bearing column. And afterwards, he said, Mom, this was the day, I think it was the day before or two days before that last time that we spoke. And he said, this is some great information for you to share. This is, this is the answer. Do you, do you guys remember when I was saying about sitting in the kitchen and those friends of his, John's came in town? And they, these girls said, this was after a horrific episode with Kelsey and she was so super ugly and mean and terrible. And so was I, and it was awful. And then these girls, his friends came in town and they sat at the counter talking to me. They're like, your home is so peaceful. I can, we can just sense God's love in here. And I was thinking, I, I don't even know what to say with that because of what had just happened that they didn't see. And that's in the first video about it. But when we heard that sermon, it that is what happened. The the load-bearing column 
is like if you look at a beautiful southern plantation home and really maybe one of those is structurally important and it bears the load of the rest of the house a lot of them are just decorative columns aren't they so with the storms of life or if they got crushed it would still remain they're just decorative and that is what was a picture to us of what happened that day in our home was even though things were crushing around us, our foundation was in Jesus. And that peace was still on our home, even though there were moments and times of great chaos and turbulation. And, but that peace is there. And you can have that too with Christ as the load-bearing column in your life when, other, when the decorative columns crush around you. Alexis was 18 and she'd been in Brazil uh, for, six, for six months of this, the first six months. And she had spiritual warfare going on in her, truly in the place where she was at the time. And so like we couldn't tell Kelsey that anything was wrong with her because she was irrational and it was all my problem and everybody else's at the time, but I remember, and Alexa said she remembered this, being on speakerphone with her in Brazil, quoting with Alexa Psalms 91, which is, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress, my God and him I will trust. And we would go on and on, but I was praying over Alexis's situation but over my own home at the time with Kelsey hearing this, which she thought we were praying just for Alexis. And isn't that neat that God allowed that parallelism, but uh, Alexis just remembers really being burdened and praying a lot and praying over, uh, praying scripture over her. And okay, Daniel, she also remembered coming home and being terrified of it. Daniel was 16. He was dual enrolled in high school, which, uh, you know, if you don't know, that just meant he was a high school student, but he was going to FSCJ, the community college. So he's dual enrolled. And he said things uh, would happen that just didn't make any sense. You know, it was scary. And his lesson is that God was in control and God was sovereign. But he had a very difficult time with this. And so, but he looks back on it and sees so much good from a very confusing time. Laura was 10. She was homeschooled. Uh, and so, in other words, she was home all day, seeing this in and day in, day out. And Laura's a quieter temperament. And so I was very concerned about her holding things in and not really knowing how to gauge things. And she recalls wondering if she'd be normal again. And she was scared, and she remembers the switch flipping, as I told you we referred to it. She remembered that. She also remembered the day that I came home from the doctor with Kelsey and standing by the car, and she said, and she and Heather were both there, and they said, what did the doctor say? And I said, she said that Kelsey's going to be okay. And the deep cry I've never heard her cry like that before or since. But all that worry and concern just stored in her little heart, just broke my heart. I said, the doctor said she's going to be okay in time. And then Heather was eight, and Heather's more out there. She tells you like it is, and the lesson that Heather needed to learn. Laura needed to talk, and I spent a lot of time just being there for her and talking. And then Heather needed to learn self-control because she would lash right back out and be like, we don't need this in our home. We're all crazy. <laughs> and, but, you know, I would pull her aside privately and tell her the importance of self-control and judging. She had a judgmental spirit and she'd like to point it out. Now you guys know the spiritual gifts and all that, but when Oftentimes when you see things clearly as sin, the temperament, you know, that usually goes with that is you see people sin very clearly, right? And so you think you need to tell them about it and, and you don't. 
you need to operate with the Holy Spirit and only say when he says to and in the manner that he says to. And oftentimes it's not up to us, but sometimes it is. And that's what she needed to learn. So I was busy working with her on those things. So that's kind of our role in all that is to be aware of the temperaments and ask them, Lord, give me insight to that child, Lord. Oh, that one, losing that one. Give me insight to that one. Help me, help me coach them. Help me be there for them, Lord. Oh, I wounded that one, Lord. What do I need to change? And I'm talking faster because it's exhausting to do all that. But really that's our role as a mom through tough times and also through normal times. That's how we should be operating. Um, okay. I wanted to then move to, oops, I gotta get this back out. I had pictures on here and they didn't print. So I gotta pull them up. I also wanted to say something about Mel. Mel, would you come up here, please? She's so flexible, I didn't tell her I was gonna do this. Isn't that nice? I love you. This, this lady right here, she, we call ourselves Pauletta and Timothea. Did I say that right? <laughs> Paul and Timothy, get it? You like get from it? the Bible? Like see, <laughs> in scripture? <laughs> but Mel was so important to me then, and she is now as well, but I wanted to brag on you. <clears throat> All right, you ready? Even though, like Paul and Timothy, there was a time Paul was mentoring Timothy, but do you remember when Timothy was there for Paul? And that is Mel during the darkest of the days. And so I asked her yesterday if she would, like, what do you remember, Mel, about it? Because I also knew because Mel had been working in our home and was part of our life, she too was part of what God was doing through all of this. And I didn't want to keep her out of it because she was, part of the growth that could take place mm -hmm. in it. And I wanted to be real with her too, because that's part of what I wanted to mentor to her. But she was in turn there for me. And so I asked her to, I asked her during this time to, if she would keep kind of keep a record of what was going on. And you know why I was able to do that? Because I knew the outcome. I didn't know when the outcome would be, but I knew the outcome would be beautiful even if the situation didn't change or end, I knew God was at work in my ugly heart and in my children's lives. And that's what he wanted to do. And I wanted somebody to record it because I wasn't in the right frame of mind. <laughs> and she recorded that. And so, come here. Do you want to read this? Uh, sure. Okay. You put her on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> so nice. Can you read this? Yes. This is from her journal. Okay, so this was the night, I think, that we had gone to visit a friend from um, Mayo, and then um, she's been such an encouragement in my life, and then we were talking in the car, and you just lost it, uncontrollable crying, and so um, so I went home later that evening and just kind of wrote down how she had encouraged me in that moment um, and how I could just pray to the Lord of how I could be an encouragement to, to her and her family. Um so I said, the next six hours changed my life and are as follows. Miss Rhonda shared her heart with me about Kelsey to the very core. Just from her concussion, she has become, um, and then we discussed bipolar, lashing out at Miss Rhonda and mistaking her um, concerns as snooping. With all logic pus pushed aside, she's unfortunately hallucinated, um, uh, discussed untrue family issues, and even attempted suicide. With tears slipping down her face, she shared with me the six worst months of her life over spiritual warfare with Kelsey. Even so, Miss Rhonda committed herself to fighting for the heart of her children. I think, is this what you want me to do? Yes. Okay. Um, what else do you want me to share? Um... Is that one? Um, that goes into me teaching. Okay. Is 
No. Is that good? Okay. Well, the rest of it, I think, is this one that we can read. Like, really? Uh, I've already got it. <laughs> <laughs> like I said earlier. <laughs> Wait, go back up. And this is actually three years ago for you. Really? Uh-huh. You can go back up a little. I don't want to throw off your groove. Okay. And then I I ended it, yeah, by by recognizing that um, through all of that, that Miss Rhonda was continuing to be the hands and feet of Christ um, and recognizing that as unlovable as Kelsey was during that time, um, that we are just as unlovable to Christ and our sin is just as offensive um, to him and could never con- compare to how Kelsey was treating her family members. Um, and so I had noted and journaled and shared with Miss Rhonda that I noticed that she selflessly sacrifices her time and her agenda um, to fill my head with discernment and wisdom um, just in being transparent and allowing me to learn from the situation as well. So. Wait, stay right here. Okay. So ladies, if you if you have uh, you know somebody you're mentoring in your life, you know, pray for discernment and ask the Lord if it's something to let them in on, not to be a griper and a complainer. I mean, Mel heard me being real <clears throat> with her, but I also wanted her to see real feelings, but the end result, like, we're just going to trust God through the journey, but I called you up here because I wanted you to know you were so very important to me now, and especially during that time, as you kept me on track with the you know, you're doing a good job, you're focusing on this, and you send, text me scripture randomly, and it's always at a great time, you know how that is, and you prayed faithfully for our family, and you loved our family unconditionally, even though you knew the yucky stuff, and I love you, and thank you for being that friend in my life. Yeah, I love you too. And this sweet girl is going to be writing blogs as well as Melissa on the website, but she's moving this faithful friend is moving this month to teach in Alabama, but she'll be back because the Lord has spoken to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mel. Okay, so here's something else for helping navigate your family uh, with the right perspective. I'm going to run through this with you as the caregiver. Here's some things that you could do. Remember, everyone is struggling with how to respond. After all, when you uh, when you talk with some people, they're uh, op- they're oblivious or maybe they're defensive. That's how she was sometimes. But also keep in mind that your family or my family through hard times, or maybe a family that you know going through hard times, the family's heartbroken. They're crushed. They're confused, discouraged, angry, or overwhelmed. I mean, you name it. Feeling. You know, there's definite feelings that go with walking through suffering. So we wanted to have compassion, teach the children to all have compassion instead of being about themselves, to be about others. Um, The constant caregiving is exhausting. Would you agree with that? Those of you that have been in that situation. So we want to, and that's for the siblings too. They're exhausted. They want things to be back to normal. But guide them to think Biblically, act lovingly and persevere through this. God is doing his transforming work in the person you're caring for and also transforming us as we face the challenges. We don't own the results of what God is doing in that person, but we do of what he wants to do in our lives. Ephesians 4, 24 Um, God uses these things to make us more like him. And it says in that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Colossians 3.10, you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew. Excuse me. Uh, But Christ, your bitterness, change that. Um, Remember, we've talked about this a lot, continuously be changing. When we're no longer able to change a situation, we're challenged to change ourselves. Is that true? And then to love the difficult person, if that happens to be a situation 
in your life, enter their world as much as possible. Again, the Holy Spirit can give you discernment for this. Understand as much as we can about the whys of the particular struggles and then show love to them. Live peacefully. That's hard, but it starts with us. Therefore, my beloved brethren, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain. Learn to have God's heart for people. If there's negative thoughts in us, which there are, then we don't have God's thoughts and we need to capture the wrong ones, put them off, and replace them with God's way of thinking. And he has a tremendous heart for people. And through your suffering, you are going to have more compassion for people in that same situation, won't you? And you will be keenly aware of if you've had suffered with infertility. I know you know that heart of other people. You instantly can feel that with them. If you've had a job loss, you can relate to people and be there for them. God wants to use your pain. He sees it. He sees weakness as a door to knowing him. Let me say that again. He sees weakness as a door to knowing him. The world treats fatigue typically as only a medical problem. They give it a name, they give it a fix, or give it a pill or a program. Medical diagnosis is important, as is proper care and medicine. But God views fatigue differently. He uses it to teach us important truths. So don't miss these opportunities. If you're exhausted today, and I certainly can understand that, Change the way of thinking to, Lord, I want to get as much out of this in knowing you as I can. You might be at the point where you can't even open your Bible, or you don't have words to even pray. Have y'all ever been there? You don't even have any prayer. You just sit there and, with, like, like I did, like, get women in your network who love the Lord, will keep you on track, and say, can I text you when I am low and just ask you to pray? And then do. Allow women in your life to pray for you. And you be that kind of friend. If somebody says, will you pray with me? Why don't you pray for them then and follow up with them the next day? And you build friendships that way by caring about them. But God sees this is a great opportunity for you to Really lean on the Lord, and he will move you to the spot where you long in your heart to read God's word. But there are times when you, you don't have anything within you to even read a word on a page. And when that happens, let the Holy Spirit make intercession on your behalf. Let him pray for you and just say, Lord, I just I have no words. And just sit there and let him be that for you. And he will. Fatigue helps us to see our heart's true condition. I mentioned this already earlier. The way we react to fatigue, I know that I want to just go lay down a lot, which is being self-absorbed. Now, there's truth in that I was tired, and you might be tired, and we do need to take good care of ourselves, but sometimes we want to escape, don't we? And so we need to monitor that, ask the Lord, is this healthy, or am I escaping? And instead, Lord, I want to know you. And change, change that way. But remember, fatigue helps us to see our heart's true condition. This could be through anxiety, <clears throat> compulsivity, uh, searching desperately for a cure, you know, kind of being obsessive, trying to escape, turning to food or TV. I'm going to say I'm guilty of the food part. Uh, ex excusing yourself, like making excuses for not doing things, complaining, giving up, denial, self-pity. Woe is me. You know, self-absorption is so easy to happen when we're exhausted. But the Lord wants our true, the heart's true condition to be exposed. And then us to turn that over to him and allow him to do beautiful things with that and transforming us. And also, here's the thing, fatigue reveals not only our weaknesses and the true condition of our heart, but it, it shows us God's power. 
So if you're fatigued today, this shows us his power. Don't miss it. Don't just get through, through it. Say, Lord, I want to know your power. Meet me. I'm exhausted. I, meet me where I am. And he will do that. Fatigue teaches us his patience, his perseverance, long-suffering, and the fruits of the Spirit. It also teaches us to accept our limitations and to rely on him. And how to change, this is the last part, how to work through this. Depend on him one day at a time. And I remember going through this in different seasons of life, just saying, Lord, your mercies are new every morning. Have you all been to that point where you're like, if I can just go to bed? And one of the favorite verses to me uh, was Psalms. Oh, I don't, I don't know where I put it on here. But it's the one that says, I will both lie down and sleep. Have you ever laid down and you're like, <sighs> and I love that verse. I love to send that verse to people going through a rough time. And I pray that for them, that they will rest, deeply rest when they lay their head down. I remember praying that for Lisa Apollo. Lord, when she lays down tonight, may she rest in you. May it be a good sleep. So we will lay down and sleep. Not just lay down and be full of anxiety. Lord, how are you going to work out this problem? How are you gonna... That all, we got to capture it right from the beginning of the emotion. What, how are you going to, oh, I'm not trusting. And turn that over to him. So depend on him one day at a time or even moment by moment at some times or hour by hour. Catch yourself, Lord, I'm not trusting again. I'm going to trust you. I would literally take the situation and like visualize laying that burden down his feet. Matthew 6, 34, therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about self. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Reevaluate what's on your plate, scale down and focus on the priorities. Put focus on others and doing for them rather than being consumed with yourself. Enjoy God's beautiful nature, his creation. Dig into Psalms those turnarounds of the heart that I mentioned last month, allow God to do that and you be a part of that beautiful transformation that happens when you share your raw, your real feelings with Christ. And then there's, a, there's just a point in time where all of a sudden you go, I will trust. And that might be daily that you have to do that, but share your real feelings with Christ and tell your children about that transformation taking place. Kids, you know, yesterday I was fearful and I just went outside and I talked to the Lord. Teach them how to handle those kind of things, that that will be how they handle situations in life. Pursue medical help if needed without obsessing over it and tell others gently, kindly how to deal with your f fatigue. You might, if you, this could happen. I know this has happened in my house where all of a sudden everybody scattered. What does that say about how they predicted I would handle something? <laughs> Maybe I have taught my children, mama's about to lose it. <laughs> or, you know, she's frustrated. She's about to blame us for things we didn't even do. I mean, it happens in the home. You have a way that you handle things and ask God to reveal that to you and us to change that. Tell others gently, kindly how to deal with your fatigue. One of the things I taught my kids was when you see me being overwhelmed, then you can simply say, what may I do to help you? And my daughter, who just moved to San Francisco, <laughs> she was home last week and she was, Mom, what can I do to help you? And I was like, yay, she still remembers. <laughs> so then I asked her to clean the whole house. I mean, you know, it's only right. <laughs> um, Okay, learn to talk about other things besides yourself and your problems. Catch yourself being consumed. And the next time you're with a group of friends and you're like, I can't believe my son. And your friend, maybe you're exhausted from hearing you be exhausted. Why don't you go just stop mid-sentence and catch yourself and go, you know what? What'd you do today? And then if they fall on the floor, you realize, oh, maybe that's been a pattern with me because they're shocked that I asked them about themselves. So 
Just stop and do simple things like ask other people how they're doing. Take the time and ask your children how they are. Take your time and maybe take a moment and say, y'all want to jump on the trampoline or you want to do this and enter their world. Enter the world of another person instead of being consumed with the situation at hand. Another thing, listen to the advice of others. We already talked about that. And then know that God is doing a work in you and keep your mind focused on the story that he is writing, the journey that is to be shared, the outcome that will be beautiful because of the transformation. It most likely will be different than you expect the outcome to be, but trust God's plan and plan to give him glory for the process and for the outcome and speak of his mercies of the heart changes and the transformation that you've had in your walk with him and in what he's done in your family dynamics and what he's done in the lives of each family member out of your darkest and most difficult journeys can become your greatest life messages. And that's it. I hope that this was helpful to you with understanding how to lead your family through suffering, through dark times, but then also how to recognize exhaustion and how to handle it according to God's word and what he would want us to do so that we are life changed. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your word and thank you for how you love us and how you use suffering to draw us closer to you and that we know your beautiful character qualities and attributes through this. Thank you for loving us so much to refine us and to just teach us. And thank you for the beautiful things that you are doing in the lives of these ladies here and in their families. We love you, Jesus. Amen.